Hey everyone, this will be a general tips video for Dirt Rally 2.0's Colin McRae DLC. More specifically about approaching the flat out trophy, uh, with primary emphasis on using the controller. But the concept and tips are the same for wheel users. I just presume that the majority in the trophy community is using the tr controller. So this is what I will, will relate to. I will also share some of the things that have helped me overcome this DLC in hopes of making your journey a bit smoother. For you to have a bit of knowledge as well, and things to keep in mind while tackling this challenge. Some of these informations you might already be aware of, uh, depending on your experience with rally games, which is why I will post some uh, timestamps of each point we've talked about in this video in the description, including the DS4 settings I use when playing with the controller. I will also link some videos for some of the stages in the DLC where I will cover my approach on those specific stages slash locations. It will give you an idea of on how to drive a certain stage and just get a general feel for the country slash location. Now before you start the Colin McRae DLC, if you haven't already, uh, I can really, I really recommend playing the base game before approaching the uh, flat out trophy. Especially if this is your first rally game, because rally is a hard genre to learn and a hard genre to master. So you want to be as prepared as possible before tackling the big boy. Uh, you should also play the season one to four DLCs before the Colin McRae DLC. Just get as much practice. Just earn all the trophies from the base game, get the platinum, uh, do the season one to four uh, trophies. Uh, they're relatively simple, except for maybe one trophy from season four uh, called launch event. Uh, it's a short time trial, uh, a bit tricky, but nothing too demanding compared to the flat out trophy. Let's talk about manual and automatic transmission. The flat out trophy is doable to obtain regardless of which transmission you drive with. Uh, this is up to you, uh, but I personally drive a manual. So some of my tips and my other tips and tricks videos, you know, for the different locations will be directed towards manual drivers. Though uh, most of my tips can be applied to automatic drivers as well, so don't stress it. But from my own experience, uh, seeing as manual really has the advantage of having better control over the car, at least in general, the fact that you can decide which gear to be in at that moment, so you can, for example, manually downshift to lower gears after a high speed section without locking the brakes, and you can really get access to the power earlier. You know, like for ex another example is being able to just downshift to lower gear when taking on corners and hairpins. This makes it smoother having a fast, a faster exit when executed right. I mean, I understand if you've never driven manual transmission before, this could take some time getting used to in the beginning. And I would say out of all the racing games or the, you know, racing genres, rally games are probably the hardest to learn manual transmission in. In my opinion, since everything is going quite fast when playing, you're constantly shifting and steering while driving, but it could pay dividends in the long run. Like I said, you will have to decide for yourself which route to go. But, you know, if you're up for it, give manual transmission a chance. So, when it comes to the camera view, I don't think there's a best viewpoint for this game. Uh, it is subjective and it comes down to personal preference. But if you ask me personally, I would prefer to use any view in first person over third person view. Uh, third person view also called chase cam. The reason why I prefer first person view uh, is the fact that I get a better sense of the speed in that view. And it gives me a better feel and control over the car in fast and high speed sections. And I can make uh, these smaller steering inputs and uh, adjustments better in first person uh, than in third person, from my personal experience, of course. Though third person does have the advantage of being able to see more of your surroundings, making it slightly easier to see the road around you and the rear end of your car. Whichever view you spend the most time driving in is the one you'll be able to set the fastest times with in general. My point is, whatever you're most used to is what you'll be best at. Uh, so when it comes to assists, how much you use uh, comes down to preference.
but I would recommend using as little and few assists as possible, because the more assists you use, the more power you lose as well. For some it can be difficult driving without any assists, so I would recommend starting slowly with some assists, and then gradually reducing it as you go when doing these scenarios. You can have stability control on, uh, just don't set it too high. If you do, then try maybe gradually lowering it as you play. So yeah, that's about the stability control. Let's talk a bit about the traction control. Um, yeah, I don't recommend turning traction control on. Having it on slows you down too much, in my opinion. Uh, the only time when it's maybe okay having all the assists a little bit on is when driving the Sierra Cosworth, the RS500. It is a rear-wheel drive car. That is the one you'll drive in the beginning of the DLC. But as a good rule of thumb, in general, just drive with a little, as little assist as possible. And no assist is even faster when you're used to it. From my own experience, I'm generally faster when driving without any assists at all. I have stability, traction control and ABS off. All of it. Again, just once you've gotten more used to it. When you're doing a stage in a scenario, one thing I highly recommend you to do is to complete the whole stage at least a couple of times without restarting every minute or due to a minor mistake. If you can still drive the car, just drive it all the way to the finish line regardless of your sloppy time, or if the first AI is 20 seconds ahead of you. You approach this as if you're doing practice runs. So this will make things more manageable, because once you get to know the stage somewhat fully, with a combination of listening to the co-driver, you also learn and can what expect what to look out for on each section, from the beginning to the very end of the stage. Now each time you drive the whole stage, you will learn how much you can push through each section. This will also build your confidence with the stage. Now think about this. If you keep pressing restart on an 8 minute stage for every little mistake, sure, you practice the first half or so of the stage, well you even perfect it, but because you haven't spent time practicing the latter half, you'll likely mess up those parts because you don't know how much you can push those later sections, or worse, you'll hit a rock or an unseen obstacle because you've never gone past like 60% of the stage. So uh, the full practice runs will pay dividends and teach you the road and the details. So don't take them for granted. Every meter or kilometer you drive is progress, even if it doesn't feel like it, because the mistakes, the limits, and the unseen obstacles will be noted in your subconscious. Let's talk about weight transfer, something you will be using often in rally, regardless if you know about it or not. To put it as simple as possible, you are using the weight of the car, or manipulate the weight of the car to get a better turn. It could be anything from long and fast turns to sharper and slower turns. The more you're pushing the throttle, the more weight is distributed to the back of the car. Whereas if you let go of the throttle or use the brakes to slow down the car, the weight will be shifted to the front of the car, giving you more grip and therefore making it easier to turn when approaching any corner. How much weight you want to transfer to the front or the back is dependent on the corner. I mean, how long is it? Or how sharp is it? Or how narrow or how wide is it? Sometimes it requires a bit of experimenting and a few retries on that certain stage to learn how much balance you need for a certain section. For example, on a mid-speed to high-speed corner, sometimes you just want to get a better turn or just eliminate understeer you lift the throttle just a little bit and turn, therefore transferring a little bit of weight to the front and then push the throttle again when you're exiting the fast corner. Whereas if you're approaching a slower corner, you might sometimes need to transfer more weight to the back, therefore you must lift the throttle earlier and for a longer time before pushing the throttle again. Sometimes with sharper or slower turns, you might even want to slightly break before entering a corner and then proceed to lift the throttle and turn. Let's talk about hairpins. These are the tightest ones and requires a little more mastery. Here you have to brake before entering the corner and more often you need to use the handbrake as well so you can lock up the rear wheels just to get a good enough rotation through the tight corners. Use the handbrake when doing the sharp turn 
and release it before exiting the corner. Sometimes you don't even need to hold the handbrake for that long. It just depends on how much rotation you get. You can also use the clutch if you have clutch override on uh, when dealing with sharp corners. It will help you give a better slide through the corner and also help you bring the revs back up much faster when exiting a corner. Basically getting the power back up faster when exiting. This is especially useful for older cars as well. We also call this technique as a uh, clutch kick. While doing the turn, you press the clutch, uh, whatever button you have it mapped as, and then release the clutch when you're almost at a straight line at the exit. For better rotation, you can also use the handbrake while pressing the clutch as well. Another option when approaching a sharp turn is to use a technique called the Scandinavian flick. Another very useful trick when you want to get a better turn. To put it simple, let's say you're approaching a left corner. If the road is wide enough, right before you turn, you can turn the car slightly to the right and then use the weight and the momentum of the car to turn it to the left corner and get a better and faster turn. Basically, whichever side the corner is on, steer it to the opposite direction first and then steer it back to the side where the corner is for better rotation. When to use the Scandinavian flick is dependent on the car, the setup and how short the corner is. If the car's setup allows for good rotation through sharp corners, or if the handbrake is enough for the job, you don't need to overdo the Scandinavian flick. Sometimes a slight scanty flick is enough, uh, but basically trial and error can help determine how much is needed for a certain car and stage, or if scanty flick is even needed at all. So the last thing I want to say before we move on to the next subject is, there are many fast corners in general when you're playing these scenarios. So many times it is not necessary to always brake. Sometimes just lifting a throttle during fast turns is good enough. It can be tricky to save the car when you lose control over it, or if you oversteer. If you lose control over the car, or if you feel like you're almost losing control, my advice would be, do not continue pushing the throttle, but let go completely. And 9 out of 10 times, you don't even need to brake. Just let go. Let go of the throttle and adjust the steering until you're back at it again. It will not always work, of course. Sometimes it's too late for saving. But if you can predict a certain dangerous situation, that is a good way to save yourself and prevent the crash. While I did mention a bit about oversteering, I might as well add the understeering part. So basically, if you're trying to approach a turn and you're not getting enough rotation through the turn, so if you're understeer, you can quickly correct it by using the handbrake. But you must do it quickly. Because, you know, I do remember Colin McRae mentioning understeering being a huge crime in rally. And we don't want to disappoint him, no? Identifying areas to cut safely might require some discovering and detective work on the stages. But if you can look out for places and sections to cut safely, always take the chance so you can gain some time. Because small things like these can help you along the way, time-wise. Of course, if the co-driver says something like, for left, don't cut, you might want to be a little cautious with the cutting. There are many places, for example, in Finland, Scotland, New Zealand, Wales, and etc., where you can cut through the grass or the edge of the road. There are many championship scenarios with multiple stages when doing the flat-out DLC. One of the biggest challenges in these championships are the lengths, which takes a longer time to do than the single-stage scenarios. There is a common glitch where the AI drivers will finish with much faster times than they originally should in the championships. The glitch will appear if you leave to the main menu while progressing in the championship. Therefore, you have to do every stage in that championship scenario in one go to avoid the glitch. Although you can put it the console in rest mode, as long as you don't quit to the main menu during the multi-stage championships, you can avoid this glitch. If you get hit by the glitch, just abandon the championship to restart it again. Of course, the bad news is you'll have to do it all over again. I did every multi-stage scenario in one go to avoid this glitch in the first place, so I was never hit by the glitch personally. But if it's too hard for you to do a multi-stage event in one go that given day, you could approach it differently by doing a practice run through all the stages first to get a feel for the car and the tracks. Then you can do a serious run the next day when you go for the win where you have more confidence since you've had multiple practice runs on each stage in that one championship scenario. 
Whenever you have the chance to change the tires and adjust the setup in the service station, you want to take the chance in making some adjustments. I recommend using soft tires for every scenario, even for Monte Carlo in Sweden, where there's snow and ice, yes. It's just because the benefits outweigh the downsides, so I can't stress this enough, as you will go a lot faster by switching to soft, even if it means that they will be worn after a little while, it's worth it. Also remove any spare tires, as it will only slow you down with the added weight. If you drive clean enough, there's never a need to replace one during the stages. During multi-stages, whenever you're in the service station, after uh, two to three stages again, remember to replace the tires with a new set. Always replace with soft tires again, of course. You can also adjust the car setup, but I think it is also doable to win with the default setup for most parts. But there is no best setup for everyone, as driving style can vary from person to person. You can always try to find the right setup for you by trying out different ones provided by other users, or you can use the links from the Flat Out DLC guide on PSN profiles. Sometimes I would just use the ones from PSN Profiles Guide, the ones they have linked. Other times I would just go default setup. I don't have personal setups myself, unfortunately. These were some of my general tips for approaching the Flat Out Trophy. I also have other tips and tricks videos covering certain stages and locations with commentary, which I will link to in the description. I hope some of these tips can help you on your Flat Out journey. I will end this video by showing you my DS4 controller settings, button mapping choices, and other options. I wish you a fun and intense rally journey. Thank you for watching.